Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to my presentation, and uh, it's my pleasure to talk to you about uh, the investigations in pediatric ophthalmology. Uh, I am Dr. Ghada Zain Abidin, lecturer of ophthalmology, Monifer University Hospital from Egypt. So before we start uh, our presentation, I want you to uh, take notes. So bring your pen and your notebook. And um, uh, whenever you find something interesting or something um, new for, m for you, uh, write down the, uh, this uh, information and um, um, uh, try to uh, rehearse uh, the related topics. And uh, second point, uh, try to be uh, attentive. So uh, turn off your mobile phone and be isolated in, uh, in a room uh, to get the best of this uh, uh, lecture. And think positively. Uh, here I mean uh, if you found something that uh, you didn't uh, study well, uh, so don't be uh, disappointed or depressed and uh, at least uh, you attended today you have attended today and uh, you learned something new and try to lower your expectations so i'm not here to teach you everything i'm just to try to highlight some um, some important points uh, that it will be uh, helpful for you in uh, from exam point of view and in your practice so it's recording uh, now and uh, I shall edit uh, the recorded uh, uh, presentation and uh, send the link later on um, to our WhatsApp group. So I'm sorry, the internet here is not uh, as so good as in other parts of the world. So uh, there might be some technical glitches and repeated login, especially um, we are using the free version of Zoom. So um, we need to log again after like up 40 minutes. And it's, and it's okay for me to free to go. Uh, I, I don't take it personally. And um, I turned off the video and uh, mute your mics. So uh, our interactivity uh, will uh, yeah, is planned to be uh, via the chat box mainly. Especially if we have a large number, more than three, uh, I prefer to use the chat box. So chat box for everyone. So everyone can see uh, the answer for any of my questions. Uh, and if you have any questions, you can post it later. Uh, and I, I might address them uh, in the edited recorded version. All right. Uh, so the first 30 minutes is about uh, warm up slides. So um, we are having like uh, gen general information, general background about the topic uh, because uh, I want to uh, start my presentation when more uh, students come in. So uh, as you may know, uh, I'm one of the faculty of uh, Most of Sami Virtual University for postgraduate students. And uh, I have joined uh, the university in 2006 as a student, and now I am a professor. And uh, first, I would like to thank uh, Professor Dr. Matsustami. He always a great inspiration for us, uh, including me. And um, he always uh, supported me and helped me a lot during my uh, exam preparation. And I like his quote uh, that uh, there are two ways to spread the knowledge. Let me the candle or the mirror that reflect it. Where I can't be the candle, let me be at least the mirror. So uh, I try to be uh, a good teacher and I'm, um, I have some affiliations, but I am proud of being a teacher at last. I'll also, um, he, he invited me to join this group uh, like uh, nine months ago. And finally, uh, here I am, I'm doing my first meeting. And I'm uh, very happy that many of our students are Indians. Uh, I've been to India twice and I have a positive experience with many Indian people. Uh, one of them is Dr. Koshik Tripathy and he is also a member of our group. And I've met him in AOS in 2018. Uh, I'm, of course, on the uh, left side. 
And also I would like to thank all my patients and their families because without their help and their consent to, to be photographed, I wouldn't be able to know uh, to do any sort of presentation. And this is my financial disclosure. I have nothing to disclose. And here's my motto, what we learn with pleasure, we never forget. What we learn with pleasure, we never forget. So I, sometimes I get message that then the internet is unstable. So this is why uh, if you find um, some pause in the middle, uh, please uh, send the message to WhatsApp group. So I can know that there is something wrong in the internet. So we have to find some enjoyment and some fun during studying and during learning because uh, as we do, we are doctors. We are we are keep learning to provide our patients with the best possible care. So we have to find um, some enjoyment. Um, it will help us to uh, continue our life and for help for well being as well. So in order to take care of our patients, we need to take our uh, take care of ourselves as the first place. So I want to be sure that everyone uh, is listening to me. You can say yes uh, in the chat box. I, I want you to practice doing the chat box in the, um, while you are listening. So you have to be multitasking uh, as I am now. So I'm seeing the participant, I'm seeing the chat box and I am uh, concentrating in my presentation as well. So thank you, thank you. So uh, what's my goal or uh, in today? So help you not to pass the exam. What? So how, this is uh, not I mean, what he, I, I, I help you to pass the exam. And uh, this is our uh, message in the faculty and to provide your patient with the possible uh, best care. Uh, because this is our uh, uh, our job. So uh, again, uh, this presentation is not uh, like an exam uh, oriented presentation. Uh, I'm going to highlight some important points. Uh, it help you to in your practice, and if you practice well, you will pass. Um, passing the exam will be like a second nature. So again, we are together for about one and a half uh, hour, and uh, I, ho I hope you will uh, not find this presentation boresome or anything else. So as you know, as we all know, that there are three pillars to reach the diagnosis. Uh, detailed history, uh, thoroughly examination, and um, Sometimes we need to order some investigations in order to reach to um, diagnosis or at least to narrow down the diagnosis so we can, we can treat. So uh, our goal is to treat. And always remember this, uh, that uh, treatment is not enough. We have to follow up our patients to see uh, to see the response to your treatment. And sometimes um, during the follow-up visits, you again taking another history, missing point on your history, missing point on your examination, and you might order some more investigations uh, during the follow-up visits. So if you are seeing a patient for once and without following him, this is not a the good practice. So my title is about investigations because it's kind in the middle. So you have to uh, do um, correct history taking and examination and in order to, uh, you need both to order the proper investigations and then diagnose and then treat and finally treat. So this is kind in the middle in our uh, medical care management. So there are too many questions. Uh, so every topic you study, every topic you study, you should ask you uh, about this. This, this abnormality or this disease, do we need an investigation to confirm a diagnosis or for differential diagnosis or not? And what kind of investigation? And are there any, is there any order? You have to start by less invasive and then inv invasive one. So 
um, while studying the investigation in every disorder, try to think about some of these questions. Uh, do we need to order investigation to screen the other eye, to screen the other fam family members? Um, is this investigation is one time or, we, or do we need to do it regularly on a regular basis? Uh, so um, this is very important. Um, so pediatric ophthalmology, you should be aware that children are not uh, small, uh, small adults. So uh, pediatric ophthalmology uh, or pediatric ophthalmologist um, doctor, um, actually he or she need, needs training before practicing uh, seeing pediatric patients because they, are, they have different anatomical and uh, physiological and immunological response. Um, they are not cooperative. They can't express what they feel. So, um, uh, and here uh, the disorders in pediatric ophthalmology is somehow different from those of adults. The management is different. Congenital glaucoma or like pediatric glaucoma and pediatric cataract is not as uh, adult cataract or adult glaucoma, for example. So pediatric ophthalmology is subspecialty of ophthalmology that concerns with eye diseases or visual and visual development and vision care in children. And be aware that uh, there is something called ages and stages in uh, pediatric age group. So we have um, newborn, and newborn could be um, preterm. Um, and here comes the importance of ROP, retinopathy of prematurity, or uh, full term. And then uh, until the, the end of the first year, this is the infancy, followed by toddler, uh, one to three years, and then preschool and grade schooler. And be aware that um, the toddler uh, age group is very uncooperative. They are big kids and they struggle. Uh, they, they are very powerful and uncooperative and yet pre-verbal. They are uh, not intangible. You, you can't sometimes understand them and they, do, they don't understand you sometimes. So uh, this age groups, um, group needs a lot of cooperation and patience from your side. Just try to imagine that they, they are your children or your uh, friend's children, so uh, to be able to communicate with them. And finally, the teen. Uh, so this is like a, um, a very uh, large time period. And that's why um, I, I tried to categorize the, the pediatric ophthalmology according to the timeline into first neonatal ophthalmology. Try to, um, to, to help you or to like to be, uh, to encourage you to be attentive to the age of presentation. So uh, there are a lot of uh, disorders in the pediatric age group, but every topic, every disorder, you have to be attentive. What is the age of presentation? Is it at birth? Is it early in infancy? Is it uh, in late childhood, in the first decade, in second decade? This is really important. This, the age of presentation is very important. So as we all know, the visual development is most active and vulnerable during the first three months of life. And that's why uh, the neonatal period is very crucial. And any abnormal visual stimulation can result in permanent damage to the visual cortex, especially the visual cortex. And that's why uh, early treatment and early screening of pediatric eye disorder is very, very important to promote visual development. Uh, here I put the macaque uh, monkey photo because uh, many of the amplioca studies uh, were done on the uh, monkeys. So uh, during my presentation, as I said uh, before, uh, it is an interactive session. 
and it's about to end in uh, eight minutes uh, and we will need to log in again um, so this is the first question uh, so uh, remember we are talking today about um, some topics related to the neonatal period so here's the first question what does this face remind you about so you can answer in the chat box of course but as you see here, uh, there, uh, I put here an emoji as a source of distraction. And um, I made this uh, diagram in a different way. Yes, of course. Thank you, Navid. And uh, sorry, I'm saying the name without this title. So with respect to all, I'm saying only the name, the first name. And uh, ROP, Sina, Sana, Sana. So this is an ROP. So here, my message that you may be familiar with the photo of a sign in a disorder, but in the exam setting, because of the stress, and also because the sign uh, may appear in different um, unusual way. So you are familiar with only one picture in your textbook or in your source. Like you are familiar uh, with the diagrams of ROB zones in... Um, so here you are familiar with the diagram of ROB zones in a different way or in a white background. And, in, and now you have like a circle, like an emoji uh, face, right? Like an emoji face, it's different, but it's about the same uh, concept about the zones of ROB. And that's why it's important um, just before the exam to revise only photos from different sources. Only revise the photos. You can spend two, uh, two, two, two days, like, like more than two days, just checking the photos, only the photos and the legend uh, under the photo. And you may Google. So uh, you, you are familiar with like um, the Haps trial of congenital glaucoma in, um, in, a, in a particular um, appearance. And now in the exam, the Haps trial appears um, um, with the red reflex behind them. So, so you have to familiarize yourself with the different photos for the same sign or the, for the same uh, abnormality. And this is the zones of ROP. Of course, everything in the ROP is very important to note um, precisely because this is a very important topic. And uh, be aware that the, the circles, we have two circles and crescent, temporal crescent. The two circles and temporal crescent are, um, are centered on the optic disc. So this is um, the dark circle here is the optic disc and not the macula, not the macula. And that's why there is screening for newborn babies in UK, uh, something called uh, NIPI, a newborn infant physical examination within the 72 hours after birth for early detection um, of any abnormalities. Um, I'm not reading the slide because you can read it uh, um, in the edited form or the recording uh, version, uh, but this is about uh, the importance of screening in the neonatal um, period. So before I shift to this next slide, um, do you know, um, we, uh, you all know about the, we need to screen for our visa, right? Okay, there is another disorder in the neonatal period we should screen for. And it's, it's, it's actually screened in the US. So all newborn are screened in the United States for uh, a systemic disorder that has an ophthalmic complication. Does any of you know this disorder? So again, again, in the United States, the screen all babies for a systemic disorder. This systemic disorder is actually an inborn error of metabolism. And uh, it has many complications uh, and among them is ophthalmic complications. So does anyone know? Yes, thank you, Tamana. Tamana, it's galactosemia. So galactosemia, Galactosemia is, is an important topic. Even if you, uh, I've never diagnosed that galactosemia before. I am, I, I, by the way, I'm, I'm only um, a strabismologist. I'm seeing only patients with ocular motility disorders. So 
I am currently not practicing uh, other, uh, other abnormalities in pediatric age group. I'm only uh, involved in strabismus and nystagmus. And that's all. So, uh, but in order to do this presentation, I have to revise some papers about the galactosemia. It's there, it's screened, it's important. And from uh, exam point of view, you have to study to, su to study it very well. So now, uh, so whenever you see this emoji, uh, there is a question. So what are the most important? So here, the most important, what does most important mean here? Important, it could be common. So what is um, what are the important disorders? Important disorders are not the exam uh, that appear in exam. That appear in exam, it's actually important because they are common disorders. They may are uh, they may uh, um, or disorders that are uh, vision threatening or life threatening. So common disorders are are important. Rare disorders that are vision or life threatening are important too. So and then they appear in exam. This is a logical consequence. So what are the most important disorders? Uh, in which the age of presentation is too early. The uh, patients present in the neonatal period, in the first months. Uh, they may come to you at one day after birth, two days after birth. So, uh, so you can uh, write down in the chat box uh, what are the most important disorders. So here is my question again. What are the most important disorders? Uh, patients. Uh, or babies uh, come to seek the medical advice, their parents bring them to seek medical advice in the neonatal period. Here is my another message. When someone asks you about causes, complications, or signs, and there are like a more than three, four, five, six, you start, um, you have, you start your list by the most important. So uh, someone said here, uh, all are important, I, be, uh, I believe, but um, I want to hear the first one. Okay. So you can say congenital only, uh, Dr. Faru. You have to say congenital what? Because sometimes the disorder is congenital, but presents late after neonatal, early infancy, late infancy. Uh, early. So the insult is congenital, but presents um, after the neonatal period. So like, like, like congenital glaucoma, most congenital glaucoma um, cases present uh, in infancy, not in uh, neonatal period, unless it's very severe and started early in utero. So uh, retinoplastoma, I, I'm, so here to be, try to be um, attentive to the key words in the question. So I'm asking about the age of presentation uh, during the first month. So retinoplastoma, uh, so it could be, it could be a uh, retinoplastoma because some babies who are screened for ROP, uh, rarely uh, they can detect retinoplastoma very early on. So this is, this is a typical presentation. This is a typical age presentation for retinoplastoma. Retinoplastoma you can expect in late infancy. Um, so nobody uh, mentioned ROP. So ROP. So I want to uh, hear the ROP at first. Uh, now I'm commenting on your answers. So uh, again, so you have to be uh, attentive to the keywords in the answer. So I'm asking about not all disorders in pediatric age group. I'm asking about the age of presentation in the neonatal period. So I'm expecting to say ROP, retinopathy or primitivity, because we are screening uh, those babies. Um, while they are in the NICU, in the neonatal intensive care unit, in the incubation. And cataract and glaucoma usually presents, present during infancy um, unless they are very severe and very uh, significant. So here I am writing the abnormality and the related um, questions that you have to prepare very, very well. So ROP, and you have to know the workup of leukocoria, 
and this is why I am um, all right. I, I wrote uh, infancy in brackets because uh, mostly uh, the causes of leukoria, the long list of leukoria, um, usually present after after you newborn, so in the infancy, and some of them uh, during the um, actually during the childhood, like uh, like coats, for example. So all in here for uh, some of you uh, mentioned uh, of salminotorum. So you need to know the workup of watery eye in an infant or in a child. Uh, and you have to be careful. The workup for watery eye for an infant or for a child is different in the management uh, and in the causes from watery eye in an adult. And uh, of course, some of you uh, mentioned the corneal opacity. So some of you, men uh, so one of you mentioned corneal opacity. So corneal opacity is a sign and not a disorder. So I'm asked about disorders, not a sign. So you can say corneal opacity. You can say, for example, a CHID, congenital hereditary uh, endothelial dystrophy, one of the corneal dystrophies that present at birth, but you can say a sign. Uh, congenital dacrocele, none of you mentioned this. This is um, uh, very important and they present early. Uh, and the related topic is workup of swelling in the medial cancerous area, Devol uh, developmental disorders or anomalies, and we have congenital cataract, and uh, you need to know again the workup of leukocoria and uh, glaucoma, and especially in infancy, and the workup of watery eye, large cornea, blue sclera, corneal opacity. So a lot of differential diagnosis for glaucoma. And birthmarks. So um, uh, according to the list, uh, some of you mentioned um, posted in the group, uh, the ROP is very important. So in our practice and in exam. So everything is a uh, long to is. Um, um, long topic uh, and it needs a lot of study time. So uh, take it uh, in pieces. And the best part uh, or the best way to study the ROP is uh, if, if you have like an ROP screening protocol in your uh, hospital, you try to observe or attend the clinic or um, to follow uh, or like follow a doctor who are, screen, who are screening ROP. So this order number one, uh, retinopsy of prematurity, uh, and um, and this is why it's important because it's uh, it's a leading cause of irreversible blindness, blindness uh, in the world, and it needs a screening and it needs uh, timely uh, treatment and management in order to um, to cure it or to make some regression. So uh, my presentation is about investigation. So uh, sometimes um, examinations in, in pediatric, uh, we call it investigation because sometimes we need to examine them under anesthesia. So it's a kind of investigation because it's like invasive. We risk the, uh, there is some kind of risk while examining baby under anesthesia. Uh, and we all about, we need the indirect ophthalmoscope to examine the, uh, and the screen for ROP. And here is the uh, examination red cam. You, you have to be familiar with this uh, modality, red cam. Uh, this is a kind of fundus uh, camera, uh, which provide a large view of fundus examination. So we have for ROP, conventional of salmoscopy, conventional method of examination, which, uh, which is by indirect of salmoscope, and uh, the red cam. So some of you mentioned also for chat box, the torch. Uh, it's very important. We, uh, it is um, one of the causes of congenital uh, cataract and congenital rubella syndrome is very important. Okay, here is a question. Um, so uh, you, you all know about the Viva and uh, um, this is the old system. I, I don't know the current system now, but uh, you, you will be presented with, you, the doctor will present you a, a picture or a photo, and you ask you about, uh, to about 
uh, the picture to comment or uh, as a start of the questions. So uh, first describe, and then there may be some questions related to the photograph. So I, I need uh, I need you to uh, in the chat box to comment on the uh, this picture in the left side, left side of screen. So uh, am I audible? Uh, I, I I don't have any response. I don't see any response here. So uh, in direct of salmoscopy, Doctor Wash, and so uh, if we have a written specialist. Uh, it will be a, it will be a bonus so you can enrich our presentation he can enrich or she can enrich our presentation so in the of salmoscopy uh, so uh, with indentations excellent in a baby more uh, detailed answer um, so the technique is in the of salmoscopy um, Sclera indentation. So I'm reading the answer. So what? Uh, uh, so using the condensing lens, uh, usually we use the uh, plus twenty eight, and uh, you can add more. You can uh, that I'm examining here. Uh, what, what, what part? The periphery of the retina. Which one? The nasal of which eye? The left eye. So this is a more detailed answer. You you have to talk. Yeah, you have to talk, and uh, uh, your words should be uh, relative, uh, re um, relevant. It should be relevant to the, what you are seeing. So I are the, uh, examining the left babe, the left eye uh, with a sclera indentor. Examining the uh, the nasal sclera. Excellent. And um, suppose that the finding is um, is in the right uh, side. So I have a uh, need to, to comment on the fundus picture of the uh, right side of the slide here. Uh, what are the signs? Yes, left eye. So uh, actually, uh, someone uh, said, for Dr. Farouk is under anesthesia. So uh, routinely, we screen ROP uh, without anesthesia uh, while they are crying and while they are awake. So um, uh, we don't use anesthesia until the, uh, the baby is big uh, during the follow-up visits. Okay, I need someone to comment on the fundus picture here. And this is a fundus picture using the red cam. And I, have to, I photographed it uh, during my uh, ROP observation course in Arvind because we don't have a uh, red cam in my hospital. So, uh, okay, you're welcome. So, uh, so Dr. Farouk, can you comment on the fundus picture here? Uh, we have like uh, 10 participants, nobody. Uh, so if you don't, yeah, at least you can. Uh, so this is another advice. Um, try to describe what you are seeing. This is the fundus picture, the fundus photography. Okay, uh, and you look at the disc and the vessels. So what, what you are seeing now of the left eye. Okay, uh, this is an excellent answer, Dr. Sana. So Dr. Sana is saying it's type one, type one. So she, she awares about the uh, classifications of type one risk and type two risk for ROP. And this is an uh, updated classification. And uh, here, Sana is uh, um, Sana's answer uh, is like a, a title. This is a type one ROP. So between brackets, Sana, you have to mention uh, what you are seeing. This is an impressive answer for me. It's enough, but uh, sometimes we need to add more detailed uh, description, like uh, what is the type one uh, ROP. So I can uh, unmute you, Dr. Sana, to, uh, to say it loudly. So if you want, yeah. So plus disease. So zone one. Hello, ma'am. Yes. Yeah. Can you say uh, it um, loudly? Because uh, in exam, you have to speak, uh, speak not, to, not to chat. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, I can see a fundus picture of the left eye, most probably. And I can see that uh, uh, the disc 
uh, and the vessels are uh, uh, there is dilated and tortuous vessels uh, in all the four quadrants. Yes, excellent. Um, so, so most probably this is a case of uh, type one ROP, wherein uh, we are seeing the zone one, and uh, uh, there is plus zone one with plus disease. Okay, uh, that is what I can. So, uh, is uh, so. What's the next step? Dr. Sana, what's the next next step? Uh, so uh, next step in investigation. What? Uh, uh, next step in investigation, ma'am. Yes. Are you asking that? Uh, so uh, yeah. So uh, um, do you need investigation? So I, I mean here uh, the management, like, like the treatment. Uh, yeah. Actually, this is type one, so it needs to be managed immediately within seventy-two hours. Excellent. Uh, well done. Yeah, perfect. So uh, this is, I, I, I want you to be um, attentive to her, her answer. She is, she is very knowledgeable about the topic. So here's the timing. So sometimes you, you need to know the, is it an emergency? Is it an urgent? Is this, uh, or like you can manage after two weeks or, so here the first, um, the first, her first sentence is about the timing. The timing of management is urgent. She said within 72 hours, and this is important at the beginning of your answer. So you can continue, Dr. Sana. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I would like to just try. Uh, we need to actually address this patient immediately within 72 hours, that's what. And uh, um, I think we can proceed with uh, anti-VEGF um, because it's in the zone one. So, yeah, anti vegf bevacizumab injection. And uh, uh, we can actually um, examine the patient under anesthesia. Okay, excellent. that's enough because I'm I'm not an ROP. The expert. periphery, we can take the periphery of the fundus. And uh, okay. hello, ma'am. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, that's enough. Okay. You can... Okay, ma'am. Okay, thank you. You can unmute. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, and also, um, she aware about the uh, advanced uh, modalities in the ROP management, and that's why you have to be uh, to update your sources of study. And um, so, if you are studying ROP from uh, like the old version of Kaniski, so you 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 wouldn't find uh, find. Uh, Avastin or anti vegf injection for ROP. So uh, especially in medical retina, uh, there is something new every day. So you have to update your uh, knowledge about the uh, recent uh, investigation modalities and recent uh, treatment modalities. And um, you can expect everything to be asked in the exam. Uh, like how do you examine? Uh, so we need a special speculum for examination for uh, for in, in, in newborn uh, Alfonso eye speculum, uh, and uh, as I mentioned, um, try to um, um, mention RITCAM in your answer while you are screening or examining the uh, babies because it's also uh, a, a modality for documentation and uh, for digital processing of imaging uh, for consultation and for telemedicine. And I, I've, took, I've taken, taken these photos in Aravind uh, Eye Hospital because uh, telemedicine is uh, well established there for ROP. They, went, uh, they, they go for remote areas and screen babies and transfer images to consultants uh, to provide immediate real-time uh, decision in every uh, baby. And this is so impressive. And uh, again, you have to know about everything, like uh, whom to screen, when to screen. And uh, so not only the uh, classifications of zones, stages, and management, um, and everything about the disease, about the screening. You have to know about the screening, everything about the screen. And um, here's the, the screening criteria is different from, from, uh, from every in every part of the world. So in India, it's different from uh, the UK and the US, because in India, in Mexico, and I presumed also in Egypt, uh, in Jordan. So ROP can develop um, uh, in bigger babies, 
uh, I mean, um, uh, bigger here means uh, birth weight higher than um, uh, the standard for US or UK and in older babies. So uh, screening criteria, because the exam is uh, British, uh, so uh, you can study only the uh, criteria uh, in UK. But because you, you are an Indian, for example, you have to know the, the screening criteria in your country, your own country. Uh, this is important in your practice. So in my hospital, we're using the uh, guidelines, uh, uh, the Indian gu guidelines, which is uh, almost similar to Mexican guidelines. So uh, despite we are talking about neonatal ophthalmology, this is, again, as you see here, a picture of uh, actually a girl, uh, uh, 18 year old uh, girl, no PL bilateral. Um, so everything is wrong with her eyes. You come adherent, band cartopathy, uh, uh, and also uh, high OP and uh, closed the funnel uh, uh, retinal attachment in both eyes. So, uh, and by taking the, uh, her past history, uh, she won of triplet and she was premature with long admission uh, in NICU, neonatal intensive care unit. So she have like an advanced untreatable ROP in both eyes and she presents with the complications, the sequela of ROP. And here is my message. You have to be aware of the uh, signs of the active disease and the chronic or like uh, the remnant. Sometimes the, uh, the disease is resolving or regressed or um, um, it, become an act, it, it becomes an act inactive. So have you, have to, have to, you have to familiarize yourself with the uh, signs of inactivity or the complications. Because without taking the history of ROP, it's, diff it's very difficult to know what's going on in her eyes. Okay? All right. So uh, as you see here, here uh, this is an old paper, and it shows that it is a case of retinopathy of prematurity. This is like um, um, 18, 18 years old um, paper uh, report. And here the uh, operator mentions the old name of ROP, retrolinter fibroplegia. This is an old name, uh, nobody's using it now. And uh, this is an ultrasound uh, similar to here ultrasound, as you see here, uh, retinal cyst and closed narrow funnel, the traction retinal attachment. This is another case uh, I photographed in during my fellowship in the US and um, uh, he is a seven old and old uh, boy. And again, although he was treated for ROP with diode laser, he uh, presents with high OP uh, band keratopathy and uh, he was admitted for chelation of band keratopathy because it causes um, discomfort and irritation. So again here, uh, so we have to be, uh, um, attentive to the ROP signs, the acute signs, and also the complications. And if there are any studies related to any topic, at least you should know about one sentence, only one sentence about this study. So uh, um, does anyone know about the, uh, the, name, the names about uh, ROP studies? You can uh, type it in the chat box. So, uh, Dr. Dr. Navid, uh, he he, start, uh, he or she, I don't know, but uh, it started by the most recent one, uh, one of the recent studies, beat ROP study, and uh, I don't know, uh, Dr. Uh, Yusuf, uh, what is this study? Uh, beat. What else about uh, other than beat study? ROP. So you have like you have to be aware about the earliest study about the ROP. What is the old um, the um, the oldest line of management 
for ROP, like uh, the first line of management before laser. And uh, actually, this study uh, um, defines the, the threshold. You know about the threshold and pre-threshold. And uh, yes, cryotherapy. Excellent, Dr. Navid. Cryotherapy uh, for treatment of ROP. This is the uh, first study. And then we have uh, the study. Uh, Dr. Sana uh, mentioned type 1 and type 2 risk. And this is excellent, Dr. Wash, uh, for in, uh, this is the second study, early treatment for ROP. And uh, what is the most recent study about the anti-VEGF? So BEAT is about bevacizumab, right, Sana? So this is about bevacizumab. So there is another anti-VEGF, uh, now is commonly used. OK. So we have uh, cryo-ROP and early treatment of written deposit probability, and then uh, bit, and then rainbow. So rainbow, uh, so if you have fun, you can know the, uh, what does every letter stands for. So, uh, so um, rainbow, uh, ranibizumab compared with laser therapy for uh, treatment of infant uh, born Prematurity with retinopathy of prematurity. So they are, they have taken some uh, of the initials to form this rainbow uh, word. So uh, I'm all, I'm only saying the names, but uh, you have to know some information about every uh, every study. Generally, uh, we define ROP by zones, and so you have to know every, um, what zone one, what zone two, what zone three. And here uh, in the, um, someone posted the, the recent uh, classification for ROP in 2001. And, uh, and you have to know that zone one, uh, zone two is divided into posterior zone two. And uh, again, there's, there's, uh, there are stages, stage one, stage two, and so on. And the vascular characteristics uh, like uh, uh, normal, pre plus plus. And uh, here is the type one uh, mentioned by Dr. Sana. You have to know the type one, uh, which needs urgent treatment. All right. And she said as, uh, as written and as it should be, the treatment uh, should be treated as soon as possible, at least within 72 hours. Um, so in cryo uh, study, uh, um, um, they recommend to have to mention the number of clock hours, but recently we, we don't care much about the number of clock hours. So here's a question, what stage zero ROP? So uh, your interactivity is very important, at least you can say hi. <laughs> and uh, because um, I feel like I'm talking to myself because I mute the mics, so no demarcation line. So no any signs of ROP. So and the first sign is demarcation line, of course. So no ROP. So um, so what's the next step? So you examine a premature baby like, uh, and you find nothing. You find no signs of ROP, and you said that, and you document uh, stage zero ROP. Uh, so uh, do you need to follow up? Yes, excellent. Follow up after, after. So you have a, like a recommendation uh, for the timing of follow up. You can follow this baby after one week or two weeks or three weeks or four weeks. Uh, it depends on the, uh, what are the signs you are seeing right now. So usually uh, you can see an average like two weeks, it's okay. So uh, uh, another question. Stage, uh, stage zero ROP. So during my fellowship uh, for ROP, uh, observational fellowship, uh, actually they don't uh, write stage zero. They, they wrote uh, or they write something else. So in between brackets, if we want, if we want to say something in between brackets. So uh, stage uh, zero in between brackets. Can we write something between brackets, um, like a description, like a description, instead of saying a new demarcation line? 
So instead of saying uh, no demarcation line, we can mention something. Uh, the excellent, excellent Dr. Yusuf uh, uh, vessels up to, uh, or you can say immature vascularization. So uh, she, she said like uh, vessels uh, up to zone two, and yet zone three, um, not yet vascularized or the temporal or the nasal. So this is, uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Yusuf. So when it comes to anti vegf as you know, uh, for diabetic retinopathy or uh, like in other uh, medical retina, you have to be aware about the concentration. All right. Um, especially, this is important for national exams, actually. So for national exams, for example, in my, in my country, sometimes they ask you how to uh, prepare everything about, is it, is it vial, is it ample? Uh, how to uh, dilute it, how to inject it, every, every, every step in details. But because of the uh, FRC exam, this is like time bound and the time is limited. They focused only on the uh, most important and significant points. And uh, this is a slide. And uh, because I'm a strabismologist, uh, I have one comment about the complications regarding the strabismus and or like uh, pediatric. So uh, uh, there is high incidence of strabismus among uh, uh, babies uh, with history of ROP. And uh, be aware, it could be true, uh, true strabismus or pseudo strabismus. So uh, here is my question. Here is my uh, my field, is, uh, like specialized uh, questions. If it is pseudo, is it uh, what kind of pseudo? I mean here, is it pseudo isotropia or pseudo exotropia? Okay. So someone said that, um, I'm not saying the names. Someone said uh, isotropia and someone said uh, exotropia and someone more specific and more, uh, and this is the most accurate one, is said pseudo uh, exotropia. So, uh, so it is pseudo exotropia. So uh, angle kappa is normally, uh, as you know, uh, is in the center of the, the corner reflection is the center of the pupil or slightly nasally. So if we have large, large positive angle kappa, so it would, uh, it would be like more nasal. So when the corneal infection um, appears more nasally, more nasally, so uh, it gives you an impression that the eye is, is out. So it's pseudo exotropia. All right. This is only for fun. So. And uh, again, you have to know the workup of the macular dragging and differential diagnosis of macular dragging. And um, be careful about the screening for ROP. So screening of ROP, you can divide it into two, um, into two uh, titles according to timing. So we screen um, early for early detection of ROP. So we are screening babies in the uh, NICU for early diagnosis of ROB, right? This is a one kind of screening. And again, we screen uh, children or adults, uh, like, like no, not adults, we are screening also children with past history of ROP treated for uh, strabismus, refractive error, anisometropia, glaucoma, myopia. So uh, we have like two types of screening, early for early detection of ROP and later on, in treated uh, kids uh, for uh, detection of complications, all sorts of complications. All right. So try to um, imagine you have, you have a patient. So uh, this is one of the unique characteristics of pediatric ophthalmology. So the child is will be your friend, lifelong friend, uh, with long um, with, with, with large number of follow up visits. Up to which age? Uh, until it, until the, the child is big enough, until the uh, eight years. Regarding the strabismus and amplopia and asymmetropia, uh, until here, it's written in the slide actually, until the age of three years. 
and some, uh, sometimes they say five years. So uh, regarding the strabismus refractive errors, according to five years, but again, in developing countries, um, I think we have to screen until eight years of age. Um, regarding the glaucoma, I, I don't know uh, what is the onset of glaucoma, what the age onset of glaucoma, but uh, up to 10% of premature have glaucoma and uh, nothing mentioned about the age of onset. But imagine there is a glaucoma, it will be continued for life. So uh, causes of leukocoria in newborn. So if I ask you about causes of leukocoria in a child, you can mention the list. The, uh, you know about this uh, list of abnormalities. But if I'm asking you about leukocoria in newborn, what do you think? So even, uh, even ROP, ROP can, can result in leukocoria when there is like um, extensive retinal detachment, total retinal detachment, but it takes time, right? It takes like uh, more than one month in most of the cases. So the cause of leukocoria in newborn is actually very limited. It could be cataract, uh, like significant cataract, or like a huge coloboma of the fundus. But I don't think ROP uh, would be among the cause of leukocoria in newborn. Uh, so ROP takes time. It takes time. Like uh, uh, I, I think it could be presented with leukocoria in early infancy, not in the newborn. Uh, persistent hypertens um, persistent uh, hyperplastic primary vitreous or anterior uh, persistent fetal vasculature. Excellent. This is a um, this is a variant of congenital cataract. So as I mentioned, uh, cataract if it is significant. Uh, and excellent, Dr. Navid. He mentioned uh, persistent fetal vasculature. Can anyone comment on this picture? Compil compilation of pictures, actually. So the most significant sign there is like a attraction band or like a falciform ligament, a falciform traction, or you can say macular dragging or like optic disc dragging. So this is actually uh, not uh, an ROP. This is actually a familiar oxidative vitreotinopathy. Very rarely it can be present uh, during the uh, first week of life. And one of the most important differentiating points that is, it happens, uh, there is no history of ROP. All right. Excellent, Dr. Yusuf. There is no history of, um, of ROP. And as the name implies, it's familiar. So if you examine the family members, uh, you, you will find some signs. So this is one of the important differentiation, uh, differential diagnosis for ROP. So this is an, this topic is important. So uh, we already uh, have passed one and a half hours. So uh, I'm not tired. If you are tired, uh, we can uh, stop here and uh, we can continue. Uh, so. Um, if you want to continue, uh, just uh, say yes, continue. Enjoying, okay, 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 okay. Thank you. I like Hala enjoying, she said enjoying. Okay. Uh, so we finished now with the ROP, I like the, some points about the ROP. So I, I'm, not talk, uh, I'm not going to talk about the opt of Salmon and the uh, but this is a kind of uh, a quite important topic. The next disorder is congenital dacrocele, and the related workup is the workup of the swelling uh, of the medial canthus area. Um, so uh, here is my question. Congenital dacrocele, uh, it presents very early, and um, uh, is it a clinical diagnosis, or do we need to investigate? 
So after you uh, did the history taking and clinical examination, do you really need an investigation? So actually, uh, it's a clinical diagnosis. We, we don't really need uh, to order any investigations. A swelling, blue, the medial cancer tendon, and uh, you all about the uh, symptoms and signs. But you may find uh, in the textbook uh, ultrasound, CT, and MRI, uh, I, I, I believe they could be ordered uh, for complicated uh, or complex cases, uh, something like that. But um, regarding the differential diagnosis for swelling in general at the medial cancer area, uh, it could be uh, dermoid, encephalocele, meningoencephalocele, or hemangioma. But uh, as you know, uh, dermoid has different uh, consistency and usually uh, as external angular. Uh, Meningocele and encephalocele uh, is above the medial cancer tendon. So you have to differentiate between uh, all causes of medial cancer swelling. So here is another question. Uh, there is one investigation that you might order and for some surgeon the the always order uh, during for management uh, in cases of congenital decrocy which is the endoscopic nasal uh, or nasal endoscopy because there are a uh, high association between congenital decrocy and endonasal cysts and um, Without addressing this uh, cyst, uh, the propane may fail. So uh, again, you have to be uh, aware of the uh, early management for dacrosil. The, def the definitive treatment is propping, early propping before six months. So you start by conservative management for one or two weeks and then proceed to propping. And again, if the case is bilateral, there might be a respiratory distress due to uh, the presence of um, nasal cysts. Uh, because uh, new newborn are obligatory uh, nose breather, so uh, you have to do uh, early probing, and if even if the case is presented unilateral, um, some recommend bilateral probing at the same time. So if there is any respiratory distress, it's an urgent case. Some do uh, probing in office. The next disorder is birthmarks. So uh, this is a big title, uh, and for dermatologists, they divide it into uh, nevi, pigmented uh, birth marks, or vascular marks. So here is a case of a newborn with vascular marks, and um, actually there is a spectrum of severity. It could be something isolated, mild, uh, with no any uh, consequences, uh, or it could be severe with ophthalmic complications and systemic uh, neurological um, complications. So uh, uh, one of the causes of vascular birth marks is capillary hemangioma, which is not uh, the case of this child, or uh, capillary vascular malformation. So capillary vascular malformation is the case of this uh, baby, of this kid, and um, uh, they ca it could be divided into uh, port wine stain, which is very important or neva simplex salmon patch and we need the dermat dermatologist to differentiate between both the significance of port wine stain that it could be uh, one of the manifestation of sturge weber syndrome and if it involves the lower lid eyelid upper eyelid uh, there is a high incidence of glaucoma as in this case uh, with um, juvenile glaucoma and you can see the uh, both almost enlargement of the cornea um, and it need it, uh, any case of storage over needs the screening for IOP and uh, systemic examination for especially CNS. And um, phacomatosis is an important topic and it's diffi difficult and lengthy topic. So uh, study them uh, one by one. The most important ones are neurofibromatosis, storage over, tuberous sclerosis. Uh, all mentioned in Kaniski uh, are um, equally important. Um, so here, uh, congenital cataract. Uh, so you have to differentiate between saying uh, congenital cataract versus pediatric cataracts. 
So the bigger titan is, of course, uh, pediatric cataract. So pediatric cataract could be congenital or acquired due to trauma or due to uh, inflammation or tumors. So uh, be aware between the difference between uh, congenital and pediatric. And note the connection between cataract and glaucoma. If you have a case of cataract, you search for glaucoma. And if you have a case of pediatric uh, glaucoma, you search for cataract. And above all, you have to search for refractive errors, for amplopia, uh, because sometimes this is the uh, main cause of all vision diminution. You manage the, the glaucoma uh, surgically, you manage the cataract by surgery, and you forget to follow up the case uh, for uh, check, to check the refractive error or amplopia. So finally, uh, we have like an excellent surgery, but uh, bad vision because we don't uh, we didn't address the amplopia. We don't start uh, amplopia treatment uh, with a refractive correction or patch or both. So here, a uh, cataract in newborn, uh, if you detect a cataract in newborn is too early and uh, we are somehow happy or like uh, quite happy, not because uh, it is a cataract, because we, we uh, couldn't be able to detect it early. So we can start the treatment early and manage the amplopia early. So here is a slide about pediatric cataract in general because again um, uh, some of them needs uh, some of them need uh, surgical treatment. So one of the investigations because again the title uh, of this presentation is investigations. So B scan, ultrasound. If you uh, if you don't have a view of the fundus or for documentation, uh, you need to do biometry. So uh, axial lens and curating. Uh, some surgeon uh, um, want to know sometimes sometimes posterior polar cataract is associated with uh, posterior capsular rent and the older UPM or anterior segment OCT to detect the uh, tear uh, preoperative. This is a, a kind of investigation for surgery, right? But what what other modalities uh, of investigations? Uh, I mentioned here, you can examine the parents and siblings, and um, this is a kind of investigate. So you investigate other members uh, for uh, past family cases. Uh, you have to investigate, is it this cataract is visually significant or not? You have to check uh, everything like refraction, IOP, uh, corneal diameter, the other lens, uh, the other eye, uh, the other abnormalities in the lens, the lens could be subluxated, for example. Uh, there could be anterior lenticonus, posterior lenticonus, right? So here is a question. What's the, important, what's the important of measuring the corneal diameter in a case of cataract or congenital cataract? Again, my question. What is the important uh, important uh, importance of measuring the corneal diameter in a case with congenital cataract? Um, the doctor who just joined, uh, don't worry, don't worry, it's recorded. Excellent, uh, uh, Dr. Manjunas. So uh, uh, he said something very important. Uh, and Sena mentioned something uh, in advanced. Okay. So uh, um, corneal diameter. So simply make it simple. First, uh, it could be uh, associated glaucoma. So you measure the corneal diameter if there is any suspicion of glaucoma. This is uh, the simplest and easiest answer. Uh, second answer, uh, if the coronal diameter is so small um, or like uh, less than nine uh, millimeters, this is a microcornea. It could be microphthalmia uh, and associated with the decreased axial length. So this is another, another congenital anomaly. So we have a congenital cataract and you have microcornea or microphthalmia. 
and uh, it is uh, somehow a relative contraindication uh, for IOL implantation by some surgeons. And uh, Dr. Senna mentioned that biometry. In general, uh, corneal diameter is one of the parameters in IOL calculation. This is an adult. I don't know if it is uh, for children also. She said also this is the fourth generation IOL formula. Okay, this is a kind of advanced uh, knowledge. Uh, thank you, Sana. And uh, this is so impressive when the examiner asks uh, ask a student, a uh, candidate, and he gets uh, get, uh, uh, an answer better than the model answer. <laughs> this is so impressive, like, I'm happy for this. Uh, so in national exam, uh, if I, I'm confronted, so I'm an examiner, so uh, so in national exams, if, I, if I'm confronted with a, a candidate who uh, whose answer is better than my answer, uh, uh, I, I, finish, uh, I finish the exam, the oral exam immediately, and the, he or she will get the full mark uh, blindly. So uh, thank you, Dr. Sen. And uh, what else? So we have to investigate for, sometimes we need to investigate for the etiology, like uh, galactosemia, uh, as I said earlier in the presentation, um, especially in bilateral cases. Uh, if we are dealing with um, uh, pediatric cataract, we have to exclude trauma. And uh, we need a consultation by pediatrician uh, if we uh, have a suspicion of systemic disorders or genetic disorders. And this is uh, anterior segment, anterior segment OCT uh, to exclude or uh, choose the um, uh, PCR. in posterior uh, polar cataract. You will come, Sana. And um, how to investigate the, visual, the visual significance of, uh, of cataract in general, in general, in any patient. Uh, if you want to, uh, to know if this uh, cataract is significant or not, you check uh, the visual acuity, for example. So this is a kind of subjective. This, this, that's why I, uh, I wrote here, subjective. You ask the patient, even in the history, while taking the history, uh, if this cataract interferes with the, uh, the quality of life of the patient, and so on. But in a newborn or an infant, uh, the rule of subjective is, uh, is limited because um, they, still, they are too young, they are preverbal. So we, deb we depend mostly on objective signs like uh, the cataract size, location type, read reflex. Can we see the fundus by, written, by direct of salmoscope, indirect of salmoscope? Can we see the read reflex with, nicely with the retinoscope? Uh, is there any nystagmus, uh, strabismus? What is the visual behavior of the infant? Um, uh, do they follow and, fix, uh, follow and fix nicely the light, the objects, and so on? Uh, so, uh, can anyone comment on the size? What is the number uh, that is written in your study books? So, cataract less than this number uh, is uh, visually insignificant, but if it is uh, larger than this number, it is considered to be significant. So, uh, again, you have to be uh, careful about numbers. Timing of, uh, of surgery, timing of treatment, uh, any number. Um, especially you all know about Kaniski, uh, everything in Kaniski is, uh, is basic, is general, is important. Uh, and the numbers uh, written in Kaniski, uh, most of them are important and you have to memorize them. So, um, what is the size uh, that considered to be uh, significant uh, and visually significant? Okay, nobody answering. Okay, so uh, three millimeters. So excellent, Tamana. Tamana. So uh, Dr. Tamana said uh, three millimeters. So less than three millimeter is visually insignificant. Three millimeter or more is significant. 
And also, uh, this is a slide about the visual insignificant cataract. Uh, so uh, peripheral is not as central. Um, sometimes, uh, some, types, some types of cataracts are visual insignificant, like blue dot. Um, if you see the fundus easily, so the child can see, can see, can see well. And uh, absence of strabismus and nystagmus. And this is a picture of uh, blue dot, uh, dot cataract. Uh, this is a slide about uh, um, slide of one of my patients. Uh, he is not a newborn, but uh, uh, it's, it's related to our topic about the uh, how to assess vision in uh, children or especially in preverbal uh, kids. So I want someone, uh, I want you to comment on this slide. Okay, uh, re resistance. Uh, so uh, we use the objection instead of resistance. So, uh, so Dr. Navid, uh, you can say objection, objection, objection to occlusion. And um, so objection to occlusion, it could be symmetrical or asymmetric. So your answer is, cor uh, is a bit incomplete, but, uh, but good, yeah, good start. So you have to say asymmetric objection to occlusion. So here in this uh, picture, uh, when I cover uh, when I cover the Z left eye, he is uh, calm and, and uh, drinking his juice and everything is fine. Because I'm covering the, uh, the eye with poor vision, with amplopia. But when I covered the right eye, so excellent, Dr. Farouk, he said uh, uh, amplopia of the left eye. When I covered the right eye, which is the, uh, the, prefer, uh, the eye with uh, good vision or the preferable eye or the dominant eye, he 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 object. Uh, he doesn't object. Actually, he didn't object to my occlusion, but he started to cry. So this is a behavioral test uh, to have an idea about the vision. So sometimes we can't uh, assess the visual acuity. We can't have a numbers. So visual acuity means uh, means numbers, but we can have an idea about the vision, the visual the visual function, the visual behavior. So back again to the newborn, we can assess only vision by, by, uh, by pupil reflex. This is the simplest way to check the pupil response. It is brisk and uh, normal or not. And of course you can order investigation like, um, uh, but again, the investigation like VEP and ERG, uh, usually in infancy, not in newborn. So simply the simplest way to assess vision in newborn is just to check the pupil. You can't do anything uh, further. You can't do anything other than vision. That's why uh, cataract is mainly, uh, um, the visual significance of, of cataract is usually assisted objectively by the characteristics of the cataract itself, size, locations, and type, and the uh, indirectly, the, um, its effect in the vision, like the presence of strabismus or nystagmus, it means uh, there is a visual affection, okay? All right. So in, in developed the country or uh, in some parts of the world, uh, genetic testing is a kind of routine for cases uh, of uh, bilateral cataract. Uh, but here this is a sentence, a unilateral cataract uh, in a healthy child, um, usually isolated and doesn't need any investigation uh, to check for the etiology or the genetic uh, background. And um, um, back to the uh, metabolic causes of cataract, which results in bilateral cataract. So uh, when you have like a bilateral cataract, we might think of, um, uh, of metabolic. And as I said earlier in the presentation, it is uh, screening for galactosemia is a routine in the United States. And, uh, and here is uh, the lab, uh, RBC's GALT and RBC's galactokinase. So we check for the enzyme activity because they are deficient uh, in such a disorder, right? 
And there is a nice paper about sweet and sour. So uh, it's sweet, it's, uh, it's uh, one of the carbohydrates of, uh, and uh, it results in uh, mean disorder. So there is something called classic galactosemia. Uh, and uh, so uh, there are different subtypes of galactosemia. It depends on uh, which enzyme is deficient. Is deficient. So here is a slide uh, with, uh, with animation. I, I, I tried to simplify the like, galactosemia. So galactosemia is, uh, is an important topic. Uh, so uh, uh, simply or slowly, here slowly. So there are, we have a baby. We have a baby uh, who starts breastfeeding or form, formula feeding. And uh, the milk contains uh, lactose. Okay, so in the I, uh, in GIT, the, the enzyme lactase metabolizes lactose into glucose and galactose. The problem with galactose, uh, there are uh, some important enzymes for uh, For, metaboli for metabolizing galactose, uh, transferase, galactokinase, epimerase. The most important, which uh, uh, um, its deficiency results in classic galactosemia, uh, is GALT. GALT stands for galactose 1-phosphate uridine transferase. So uh, without uh, one of these enzymes, there is another alternative pathway for, for metabolizing galactose, which results in uh, the production of uh, galacticol. Okay, so this is, the problem is with galacto, uh, galacticol. So galacticol uh, leads to cataract, and I made this, um, this figure because it looks like an oil drop uh, droplet cataract because this is a classic uh, um, sign or some classic name for uh, galactosemia cataract, oil droplet cataract, oil, oil drop cataract. Uh, this is an early uh, appearance for the galactosemic cataract. So in order to diagnose, uh, diagnose uh, galactosemia, we need to uh, do an enzyme assay to test the full deficiency of this enzyme. And in order to treat, we have to stop breastfeeding and they uh, have another substitution uh, for uh, this kind of feeding. This is, uh, I tried to simplify the galactosemia. And I want you to make the same. Uh, if you have like a difficult topic for you, um, something complicated, you have to simplify it and you, you have to make some diagrams, drawing, sketching, uh, as I said before, uh, try to enjoy the process of learning and studying. All right. So this is uh, uh, the picture of all droplet cataract uh, in galactosemia. So uh, this is a picture. What do you see in the next picture? It looks like an oil droplet cataract. Oh, it looks the same. But actually, this is uh, posterior lenticonus. And this is a screenshot from a video uh, about congenital cataract uh, from CyberSight. And by the way, CyberSight is a wonderful website with a lot of uh, resources, study, study resources, and videos, webinars, courses, and provides also consultation, CyberSight. And uh, so we have like, uh, what are the causes of all droplet reflex? In ophthalmology, in general, this is like a, a break with this uh, with this uh, general question. We have uh, like uh, some causes or for oil droplet reflex. So we uh, we have like now we we just mentioned uh, galactosemia, cataract. We mentioned posterior lenticonus, and do you might expect also anterior lenticonus. What else? Excellent, Dr. Wash. Cretoconus. So this is like a compilation uh, list for the cause of all droplet reflex in ophthalmology. And again, you have to know about the morphological types. 
of congenital cataracts. Uh, some of them linked to some causes. So I want someone to comment on this picture, picture A. So, uh, so be aware of that uh, the picture may contain more than one sign. And the case may have like many diagnoses. So uh, there is an arrow pointing to um, a white dot. It has been taken from the internet, this picture. So uh, suppose this dot is the, um, uh, the, the level is along the anterior surface of the lens, what it could be. So there is a white dot uh, along the uh, anterior border of the lens. So first you have to say that this is a red reflex slit lamp image because you are seeing the red reflex and this is bright, it's nice, except for the white dot in the center. So uh, nobody is responding, so uh, no. Okay, so uh, you can say this is anterior polar cataract. Anterior polar cataract. So, uh, so uh, you have to say anterior or posterior. It's, I think it's hard now because it's hard in this picture. Someone said advanced uh, diagnosis, Mittendorf. So it's hard to decide it's anterior or posterior because the, uh, the slit um, beam on the, the lens is not coincide with this dot. But uh, I've, I've taken this picture from the internet and it's, it's, it shows that it's anterior polar cataract. Anyway, polar, anterior, posterior. But uh, again, I, I approach this picture because is it normally? Because you are now we are only focusing on the uh, cataract, right? But we missed another sign. Is it normal to see the equator of the lens when we, we are, even if the pupil is fully dilated? Is it possible? It's, it's never, it's never to see the equator of the lens. And here is some zonules. So someone said aniridia. So uh, uh, excellent. Uh, it could be aniridia. I could, I personally, I couldn't judge because the the periphery is dim. I couldn't, I couldn't. So uh, back again. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm not going to finish the presentation. I will stop at um, uh, with cataract, but uh, we have some more slides. Uh, so we will uh, we'll, we'll finish in a few minutes, inshallah, uh, because I need to uh, edit and uh, post it. So we can continue with the presentation later on. Uh, so again, here we are seeing the uh, this is another sign. We are seeing the equator. So someone said aniridia. So aniridia. So aniridia is one cause that allows you to see the equator. There is another etiology. There is another etiology that uh, you can see the equator of the lens. So. Uh, um, so um, uh, so someone said, uh, Dr. Uh, Kersina, Kersana, Kersana said homocystinuria. She, she meant, uh, she meant uh, subluxation. So if there is a sublux subluxation, so you can say, uh, you can see the equator. Uh, still another, there is another abnormality. So you can see the equator, which is, so again, aniridia, you can see the equator of the lens. Uh, excellent, uh, Dr. Yusuf. Microspherophakia. So, microspherophakia, aniridia, and subluxation. Subluxation. And excellent, uh, Kirthana. She said albinism. So, albinism. So, this is. I, I'm very happy for your answer. So, uh, this is like an out of box answer. So, uh, albinism. So, so, because the the iris is diaphanous, and you can appreciate the the the. the uh, uh, you, by using the red reflex, you can appreciate also the uh, the equator. So excellent, uh, So we can uh, uh, say now. <laughs> someone said lens coloboma. Excellent. So lens coloboma. Uh, okay. 
anything else. So, so, uh, uh, so there are, we have like five, uh, five causes. Like you can see the equator, aniridia, microspherific, uh, albinism, uh, what is subluxation, and coloboma. And, uh, and uh, by the way, coloboma is actually, uh, is actually not a true coloboma, or like, uh, but um, it's um, defect in the zonules. Uh, so the uh, lens equator retracts slightly. Excellent. And um, uh, we have, to, so there are two signs, the cataract and uh, the lens equators, it could be microspherific. Actually, this is a case of microspherific, but uh, if you say an iridia, it's okay because you can't see if it's, there is a iris or not. The number B or letter B. Uh, again, here uh, there are uh, signs. So uh, the most uh, significant, uh, the most important sign is the cataract. So there is an obesity. But what's, what's about this obesity? There's something unique about this obesity. This is a diffuse illumination. So when you are commenting on the picture, you can say like an introducing some uh, sentence about the, uh, the nature of the photography, like, uh, like this a red reflex set lamp image. And this is a diffuse illumination. This is a fundus picture. This is a fluorescent angio. So you have to like, uh, make a title for the descriptive title for the kind of photography and then proceed to then proceed to the uh, uh, description of the science or the diagnosis or whatever so uh, uh, excellent so heterochromia i read this so he, he noticed that that different color here this is a light brown and here is a gray so it is a kind of heterochromia uh, besides uh, the cataract. And the cataract here is like two level, like there is something flat and something elevated and cured to it. So actually this is a case of pyramidal cataract, which is a var variant of anterior polar cataract. So again, you have to know about uh, torch infection, including the uh, congenital rubella syndrome and in Vietnam, um, vaccinations, rubella vaccination is not uh, one of the national policy of vaccination. So they have like a high incidence of uh, congenital, uh, uh, congenital cataract, uh, second to rubella. And by the way, rubella congenital cataract can result in both cataract and glaucoma and microphthalmia. So what's the problem? Uh, you have microphthalmia and you have glaucoma, so you, you, you don't get the pufthalmus because the eye is already microphthalmic. Uh, and there's a number of syndromes, like Lou syndrome, and uh, another list of chromosomal abnormalities that are associated with uh, congenital cataract. As, as, so low syndrome is uh, you know you you need to know some uh, some information about low syndrome because it's an important cause of cataract. And again, uh, studies studies and disorders. So we have two important studies in uh, related to the congenital cataract: uh, infant aphakia treatment study and toddler aphakia and pseudophakia study. Um, uh, in summary, um, you know about the recommendation when to implant, uh, do you need to implant IOL or not? So they, uh, they agreed that the, um, you, don't, uh, you don't implant uh, uh, less than seven, uh, seven months of age. After seven months of age, you can implant. And this is especially true for unilateral cataracts. So if you have a case of unilateral cataract, uh, younger than you and you operated younger than seven months, uh, you, you leave the patient, uh, the kid, the uh, and older than seven months, uh, you implant. Um, I think I can stop here because I want to, I, as I said, uh, to edit uh, the recording and then post it. 
and we can find another appointment uh, to continue our presentation. Um, and thank you for attending the meeting and I hope uh, you found it useful. And goodbye. Uh, thank you all, and uh, I prefer to thank me here. So you, I, I will leave the meeting for uh, one minute for uh, thanks uh, messages, and no need to uh, to do thank you and the WhatsApp group uh, I, because um, I am among the people who are distracted by by many messages. So uh, you can thank me. Uh, I want to thank you and uh, and thank you for thanking me and. Uh, uh, the point of this presentation actually to, to focus on some points. So I'm I'm not teaching you. I'm just uh, stressing on some important points. Uh, thank you all, and uh, see you later. Uh, you can leave the meeting now. Uh, and actually, this is a video. Uh, if you have uh, like a few more seconds, we can watch it together. It's about uh, uh, Lou syndrome. And this is one way of um, study tips, uh, which is uh, try to uh, to watch uh, um, patients uh, talking about their syndromes or their disorders, or like watching some uh, consultants or professors speaking about this abnormality. So this is a, uh, someone who involved in uh, management of Lou syndrome. And this is like a five minute uh, video, but you can learn a lot of information about Lou syndrome. Um, of course, you can find this information in your textbooks, but uh, this is uh, when you study, you need to uh, stimulate um, multiple aspects uh, on your in your mind, you may I mean here, you read, um, you listen, you teach, uh, you speak. So by the time low syndrome, you will be familiar with such syndromes. So sometimes uh, syndromes are difficult to study because they are rare. You, you can't see them too much in your practice. So it's like watching a movie, like uh, or match or football match or cricket or whatever. So try to enjoy watching uh, some document documentary about uh, disorders. And again, when you study from textbook, you will find them easy or much easier. So uh, uh, we can watch it together and then I will uh, 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 finish the, the event or the meeting. So Lowe syndrome is a disorder that probably affects somewhere between 500 to 1,000 children in the United States. It is a um, disorder that's also called the oculocerebrorenal syndrome of Lowe. So here I, I stop every now and then because I want you to know some key words or like key facts he is saying. So uh, Lowe syndrome, the other name for it is oculocerebrorenal. Oculocerebrorenal. So you have to memorize this. Low syndrome is oculocerebrorenal. So we have uh, so we have like the the main systems that are commonly affected in this syndrome: oculo, renal, renal, and brain. Uh, now I make it full screen to see it nicely. Um, and uh, I, I, here I clicked on CC, close the caption, so you, you can see the subtitles as well. So this is an, uh, this is like a number one information. Lou syndrome is oculocerebrorenal disorder. And that describes the three main organ systems that are affected. Oculo, the patients have the congenital cataracts, cerebro. So ocular, so you can in your study notes uh, write down Low syndrome is oculocerebrorenal. Then from the oculo, you draw an arrow and write down congenital cataracts. Don't say only cataract, say congenital, don't write only cataract, write down congenital cataracts. 
because it's one of the differential uh, the etiological causes for congenital cataracts. Okay. They have developmental delay, behavior abnormalities. Certain fraction of them have seizures early in life. So, uh, is it a healthy child? No, it's unhealthy. So, uh, when you see a child with congenital cataract due to Lewis syndrome, they have some issues. They have some systemic issues, developmental delay. So, they are not unhealthy. And then uh, they're very floppy, hypotonic at birth. And the renal is because they have a renal tubular defect where they leak amino acids, phosphate, and bicarbonate. So what's the importance of the renal manifestation? This is the key for diagnosis. So we search for amino acids in the urine, uh, among other things. So, uh... so that's a disorder. And um, I've been working on this condition starting from positional cloning the gene, which meant finding out what is the gene involved in Lowe's syndrome, not because we knew what the biochemistry was, but because we knew where it was located on the X chromosome. And by localizing it more and more narrowly, we we're able to identify the gene. I developed the enzyme test for it. I developed prenatal diagnosis for it. I got uh, molecular testing set up for it. We've been doing a lot of research, including making animal models that will be testable. But we have not pushed it over the line into what is, what are, is there a drug trial? What can we do to try to reverse or at least mitigate some of the serious complications. And that's what the parents, I mean, the parents have been incredibly supportive of the research. They understand that without research, we're not gonna get anywhere. But they also don't want it to end with research. I mean, if my publishing papers is not their interest. Their interest is, all right, what are you gonna do about Mike's son? So here is, he just said Mike's son. So here another information that this disorder is uh, X-linked actually uh, because he mentioned uh, X chromosome and uh, as you know X-linked recessive uh, disorders manifested more in boys because they have one X, boys are XY. So as you see here you, you watch a movie, you watch this the, um, talk and you uh, got some information, some uh, pieces of uh, knowledge uh, that you will find it again in your textbook. So this is the end of uh, my talk and uh, stay active, stay alive and see you soon. Assalamu uh, alaikum.